Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people, the, tr the traditional custodians of the land upon which Nightingale Ballarat stands. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people where I'm broadcasting from today. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to all First Nations peoples of Australia. We acknowledge their continued and unceded connection to country and culture. Nightingale Ballarat. And um, is there a problem? I mean, it's a great place. But fundamentally, they're growing super fast. So they're looking to increase their population by 40% over the next 40 years. And it's already in the last 20 years, it's already grown drastically, like nearly by another 40%. So massive population growth. At the same time, we see kind of urbanization of the population, um, you know, or suburbanization of the population. But um, a lot of empty nesters, a lot of older people, a lot of people living in households of less than two people, so one to two people. So 65% of people in Ballarat live in two people households or less. But the housing provision in Ballarat doesn't match that. So generally all of the housing provided is larger footprint housing. So 80% of the housing is three bedrooms or more. So there's a kind of massive mismatch between housing and what people need. And then obviously we've seen with suburbanization around Ballarat, the same thing that's happened in Melbourne. So this is in the west of Ballarat, um, a place called Delacombe, used to be great farming land uh, in 2010. And this is the same aerial photograph uh, 12 years later. So Delacombe now is all big houses, uh, small lot sizes, no tree canopy coverage. Um, so we're seeing, you know, urban sprawl spreading out over to, you know, what was the food bowl for Ballarat. Interestingly, Ballarat used to be this active, vibrant, vibrant human centric place. Like it's a really proud, incredible city, like, you know, post the gold rush in the, you know, 50s, 1850s and 60s. It became a really great kind of, you know, um, regional city. Uh, there was cable cars. There were people walking and living in the city as well as working there. And what happened over time, obviously, since 1950, um, people started to move out of the city and it became a dormitory suburb. So the centre of the city became very, very empty, particularly at night. Uh, it became much more car dominated and much less about people. And the city of Ballarat have kind of, you know, identified this in their kind of strategy plan about, you know, that basically the wrong housing is being built for its demographic and it's being built in the wrong location. So they've got this donut effect and what they want to do is to bring housing back into the centre. So Nightingale Ballarat is kind of, you know, an approach, you know, I guess it's a, it's a line in the sand saying this is one possible solution for density. You know, it's a four-storey plus rooftop, medium density building. It's 27 apartments with ones and twos and some three-bedroom apartments. Um, and importantly, it houses a lot of single females, both, both over 55, and also, interestingly, a lot of single females under 35. So both first home buyers and older people. Um, it's located incredibly well, really close to the train station. And that photo that you saw before is Sturt Street, just two streets to the south, where the cable cars were. That was Sturt Street in 1900. And so Nightingale Ballarat is just kind of, you know, a street and a half to the north of that. It's close to the hospital, it's close to the Gov Hub, um, and it's super close to the train station. Um, and we've kind of got five key moves to make this work. So there was an old asbestos shed there, an old lawnmower factory. So in the 50s, a lot of Ballarat's um, you know, row housing got demolished and kind of converted to industrial. And about the city of Ballarat want to, want to reclaim that stuff in the city centre now and change it back to housing. So this was a a lawnmower factory that covered 100% of the site. And we wanted to pull it off the kind of, you know, the housing to the west and provide a zone for deep root planting. So we kind of pulled the building back from the west. The building immediately to the north is kind of this um, cool functionalist brick building with uh, um, uh, some concrete lintels, a really good rhythm. Um, and so basically we wanted to pull off from that building, let that building stand proud to the north, make a little courtyard there, and provide opportunity for kind of some public engagement onto Davy Street, which is quite narrow. And then we worked with um, our heritage consultant and the local heritage group to look at the signage that was on the south side of that building. Um, and they found the original, some old photographs of that original signage. And then they worked with the local sign writer to come up with how they would do that. And then we worked with them to reinstall that on the, on the neighboring building immediately to the north in that little courtyard there on Davy Street. We built our parapet to match the parapet next door to build a consistent street wall so that it makes sense. We wanted to build a building that respects its past. So 
use recycled bricks, we water washed off the mortar, but we didn't acid wash off the mortar. So it's not meant to look like a new building. It's meant to feel like it's, you know, it's a building remade of old parts. Um, but you can see that the parapet lines line up perfectly. And then the colonnade kind of responds to that vertical rhythm, the building to the north. And the arches respond to the boom era of Victorian architecture that was happening through the 60s through the 1910s. We wanted to embrace its context. So there's incredible kind of views out in 360 degrees. We wanted to make sure that we captured those views and engage with the street. And then we wanted to make sure that these uh, apartments worked a lot like houses. So we cut a big courtyard into the middle. We didn't push super dense on this site, but we made sure that we could get 100% cross ventilation to every apartment in the building. Um, this diagram just shows that we've got a basement in here, which is interesting for Nightingale. And the way that they sold it was that um, they went through a ballot process, market matching, so selling apartments, housing, and some people needed a car for work and others didn't. And so basically you bought an apartment and you could choose to add a car if you wanted to. And so in the end, we built a basement size to match the number of cars that were required, which ended up being about a 0.5 ratio. Um, and then we've got a rooftop on level four, protected from the northern wind and kind of, you know, held back from the edges with kind of, you know, lush planting around the edges of that. And that's shared by the community. We worked a lot with local builders and local trades to bring local craftsmanship into this building. So we worked with local joiners, local window fabricators, uh, local precasts. We've got 40% uh, cement replacement in this um, building. It's like the, the highest replacement that they've worked with before. Uh, local metal workers. We sourced all of our materials as locally as possible. So these are recycled bricks, probably from the Selkirk factory, just you know, three minutes up the road um, from a demolished building in Ballarat and then reused again. Recycled timber flooring from buildings that were demolished in Ballarat. Tapware that was made in Summerton in Melbourne's outer suburbs. This is carbon mm. neutral tapware. And then lighting that's made in Fairfield. The whole building is carbon neutral in operations. It's 100% electric, no gas. It's powered by 100% green power on top of the PV. Um, we have a CO2 heat pump, which does the hydronic heating and the domestic hot water. Uh, and the whole building is an average of eight and a half star natters. Super efficient, super sustainable. Uh, thank you. And then I've just got some other images at the back end, the plans, um, the context, but I'll hand it over to you for questions.